the year is 1999. Summer had just begun, meaning video games and plenty of time to hang out with friends. During one of these hangout sessions, you're over at your friend's house, the one who your parents rarely let you hang out with, watching TV, when suddenly a commercial comes on for a movie. A horror movie. A movie that claims that what you're seeing is real, and that the movie isn't really a movie but the found footage of three people who went missing in the middle of the woods. For the rest of the year, you would constantly hear about this movie, but at the age of 8, there was really no way to watch it, but whenever you'd hear anyone talk about it, your ears would perk up, hoping to catch something new about this, at the time, mysterious film. This was very much my experience. Growing up, I had a fascination with horror, and the paranormal. In the first grade, I acquired a book called In a Dark Dark Room and Other Scary Stories, and I believe this is really what started my fascination. While not being particularly scary, the book featured stories that have really stuck with me, such as The Green Ribbon, a story about a man and woman who spend their lives together, all the while the woman wears a green ribbon around her neck, never telling the man why she never removes the ribbon until she's on her deathbed and she finally reveals the secret. Horror is a fascinating genre that typically has a low ceiling of entry in most forms of media. This makes horror a popular starting point for up-and-coming directors, writers, even game developers. This is certainly not said to dismiss those creators who wish to start their careers with horror, as occasionally, sometimes the exact thing a horror project really needs to leave its mark is the limitation of a low budget and the desire to create something despite this limitation. There are many projects out there that started with nothing more than their creator's desire to terrify you, regardless of budget. Projects such as Marble Hornets bringing Slenderman and the concept of alternate reality games or ARGs to the mainstream through episodic releases on YouTube, or Paranormal Activity, the 2009 found footage horror film and directorial debut of Oren Pelly that, despite having a budget of $15,000, made over $190 million, and spawned a franchise that still exists to this day. Or The Blair Witch Project, a film that was made on an initial budget of $60,000 and would, for a time, captivate audiences around the world with its mystery, lore, and ultimately, true story. 1999 was over 20 years ago. The world was such a different place back then that describing it would be a video all on its own. The 1990s was a very awkward decade for horror movies. While I'm often easily able to define each decade for what they brought to the horror genre, the 1990s is a bit harder to pin down. Much like previous decades, we get our occasional horror movies that get attention from those who often look down on the genre, with films like The Silence of the Lambs and Misery. But then we get movies like The Haunting and Leprechaun. The Haunting being a shoddy, big-budget remake of the 1963 chiller of the same name, and Leprechaun being an absurd escalation of the character slashers popularized throughout the late 1970s and the 1980s. The decade was littered with remakes and reboots, seeing very little new brought to the genre. Keep in mind, my perspective is simply from an American point of view. I know horror certainly thrived in other countries during the 1990s, but these films would be mostly unknown to Western audiences until these movies were taken and adapted into remakes with an English-speaking cast. The ease of indulging in another country's media not really expanding until the mid to late 2000s. In 1994, director Wes Craven would bring us Wes Craven's New Nightmare, a unique meta take on his most famous character, Freddy Krueger, followed by a little movie called Scream in 1996. Scream is very much a product of the 90s, and was Wes Craven's way of paying homage to the films of the past with countless references and callbacks and a self-awareness where the characters know all of the classic movies as well as the, quote, rules that those classics established. Now, despite Scream being a film that I very much do love, it didn't necessarily bring anything new to this era that seemed to be stagnant in its horror identity. As a matter of fact, Scream, in a way, almost made things worse, as now the slasher genre had been revitalized, with I Know What You Did Last Summer coming out less than a year later, along with several other teen slasher movies as the decade went on. 
This would all change, however, when, in 1999, as the year had just passed its halfway point and the decade was coming to a close, a movie would emerge that, for better or for worse, would give the 1990s its defining horror movie. The Blair Witch Project is a movie that was created during what I consider to be the last massive transitional point in technology on a global scale, that being, of course, internet access. Though off to a slow start, the internet would become publicly accessible in the early 1990s, and over time, would slowly become more widespread as the decade went on. By the turn of the century, the internet had found its way into 34% of homes in the United States, with no signs of slowing down, as more and more people realized its potential for accessing information, communication, and endless possibilities. The early days of the internet were nothing like they are today. During what is often referred to as the Wild West days of the internet, spreading sourceless information was commonplace, where despite unknown legitimacy behind claims, and the ever-growing popularity of email, instant messenger, and chat rooms, rumors were able to run rampant, be it about video games, news, celebrities, or anything else that caught the public's interest. Then again, I guess this hasn't really gone away, but anyway. During the peak of this era of the internet, the first trailers and movie posters of the Blair Witch Project would begin showing up in theaters all over the country, all of which featuring a website that intrigued moviegoers can visit when they return home to their computers, beginning what is often considered to be the birth of viral marketing. We'll get back to the website in just a minute, but first, we need to look at one event prior to the viral marketing that was paramount in getting the Blair Witch Project on the map. In January of 1999, the Blair Witch Project would be shown at the Sundance Film Festival, and as part of the advertising at Sundance leading up to the film's first showing, the marketing campaign included missing posters for the three stars of the film, informing everyone before seeing the movie that these people that you're about to watch for the next 81 minutes are now missing. What the audience is going to be watching is the footage that was found on the recovered cameras that the group had been using to film their documentary. After becoming a massive hit at Sundance and catching the attention of Artisan Entertainment, Artisan would purchase the distribution rights to the film, and plan to begin marketing the film. However, the marketing had already begun, as now the many attendees of Sundance would spread word of a film that they saw that wasn't a film, and was quite possibly the scariest thing they had ever seen. And what better place to discuss this film than with the rest of the world on the internet? Emerging shortly after the Sundance Film Festival, BlairWitch.com would become the ground zero of information behind what exactly this Blair Witch Project film even was. Upon visiting the site, you'd be met with four links to explore. Mythology, the filmmakers, the aftermath, and the legacy. And here, on this site, is where it all begins. The website tells of a legend that all starts back in 1785 in the town of Blair, Maryland. It was in this small town that a local woman by the name of Ellie Kedward would be banished after being found guilty of witchcraft. As her exile occurred during a notably harsh winter, Ellie Kedward was presumed dead shortly after, having been tied to a tree by the townspeople of Blair and left deep in the woods. Over a year later in 1786, all of those who accused Ellie Kedward of witchcraft along with half of the town's children would mysteriously vanish, leading to the townspeople of Blair to flee, leaving the town abandoned. 38 years later, in 1824, the town of Burkittsville would be founded where the town of Blair once stood. The following year, in 1825, a young girl named Eileen Treacle, while playing next to Tappy East Creek, would be pulled into the water by a pale, white arm, and would never be seen again. Eleven residents of Burkittsville claimed to have witnessed the event themselves, and for 13 days after, the creek would be cluttered with mysterious bundles of oily sticks, as well as be toxic to drink from. The town would remain quiet for 61 years, until 1886, when, after a young girl named Robin Weaver went missing, multiple search parties are sent to look for her. 
Although Robin would return to Burkittsville safely, one of the search parties doesn't return, and are later found mutilated and tied together at a particular site within the forest near Burkittsville, referred to as Coffin Rock. Upon alerting the local sheriff and returning to the site mere hours later, the bodies were now gone, never to be seen again. After this event, the town of Burkittsville would once again remain quiet. 54 years later, between 1940 and 1941, seven children would mysteriously go missing. Shortly after, a local hermit named Rustin Parr would be found responsible for the disappearances, having murdered the children after he claimed an old woman near his house deep in the woods told him to do so. Rustin Parr would be executed for his crimes, and his house would be burned to the ground on the same day. The town would yet again sit quiet, until October of 1994, when three college students would arrive in Burkittsville to create a documentary about the Blair Witch as a class project. Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard, and Michael Williams were three students attending Montgomery College located in the state of Maryland. Early in 1994, Heather would express her desire to create a documentary to film professor Michael Dakota, who would encourage Heather to pursue her interest. Heather then decided to make her first documentary about the small, local urban legend of the Blair Witch. Heather would recruit fellow film student Joshua Leonard as the director of photography, as the two previously had worked together on projects in the past and got along well together. Joshua would suggest to Heather recruiting his close friend Michael Williams to be the sound mixer, as Michael had taken classes in sound mixing, as well as hosting a show on Montgomery College's campus radio station. With the three of them together, on October 20th, 1994, Heather, Joshua, and Michael would arrive in Burkittsville and begin interviewing locals about the legend of the Blair Witch. Many would recount the legends that we discussed previously, while others would discuss the Blair Witch in a way very similar to how most urban legends are told, as a means of caution, warning children that if they stay up late at night, the witch will get them. Such warnings have been associated with other urban legends such as La Llorona, and very much aligns with the older accounts of the Blair Witch and her association with missing children. Among the residents interviewed was Mary Brown, an elderly woman who lived in Burkittsville all her life, and in fact was friends with some of the children who were murdered during the 1940s Rustin Parr incident. Mary tells of her encounter that she had with the witch, claiming she saw it once and that the witch was covered in hair, though the group is unsure of her story as they perceive Mary Brown to possibly being a bit crazy. The next day on October 21st, 1994, the three would begin their hike into the Black Hills Forest in order to locate key points of interest significant to the Blair Witch legend, such as Coffin Rock and Tappy East Creek, to provide further footage for their documentary, this being the last time any of the trio were ever seen again. By October 25th, 1994, Heather, Joshua, and Michael had yet to return home or contact anyone. Worried by this, Heather's mother, Angie Donahue, contacted authorities to make a missing persons report, and later that day, Joshua's car is found parked just as they had left it on Black Rock Road, which runs through the Black Hills Forest area where the group had started their journey. The following day, on October 26th, 1994, the Maryland State Police would launch a widespread search of the Black Hills Forest area. The search would include over 100 people with the aid of dogs, helicopters, and even a Department of Defense satellite. However, after 10 days on November 5th, 1994, after 33,000 man-hours of searching, not a single trace of the group would be found, and the police would call off the search. Despite the lack of evidence after such an exhaustive search, Angie would continue searching for Heather, Joshua, and Michael, though no further developments would be made, and in June of 1995, the case would officially be declared inactive and unsolved. For the next few months, Angie would continue tirelessly searching for her daughter and friends, until on October 16, 1995, nearly a year after the disappearance, finally, something is found. Students from the University of Maryland's Anthropology Department were conducting an archaeological dig at the site of an old cabin deep within the woods. 
This cabin was located on the foundation of an even older cabin that burned down long ago, and was simply built upon the same site, literally on the ashes of where the previous cabin once stood. During the excavation, after digging deep beneath the mulch and even beneath the layer of ash that remained from the previous cabin, the students found what appeared to be a duffel bag. Upon further inspection, the bag contained film reels, videotapes, two cameras, and Heather Donahue's journal. What's most notable about this discovery was that the ground that it was discovered in, the University of Maryland's anthropology professor David Mercer would refer to as completely undisturbed soil, appearing as if the bag somehow materialized there, as it would have been impossible for the bag to have been buried recently without disturbing the preserved layers of mulch and ash, as if the bag had been there for well over a hundred years. Upon further investigation by the Burkittsville Sheriff's Department, it's confirmed that the film, cameras, and journal are all indeed the property of Heather, Joshua, and Michael. In December of 1995, the families of the three are finally shown select pieces of film that were recovered, and despite there being several unusual events that occur throughout the course of the film, there is nothing conclusive in regards to their disappearance. In January of 1996, Angie Donahue would hire private investigator Buck Buchanan to assist in the search for the missing trio. In February of 1996, the families were once again shown more select pieces of film that were recovered, however this time the law enforcement officials, including Burkittsville Sheriff Ron Cravens, who was leading the investigation, consider the footage to be faked, going so far as to consider everything up to this point to be a hoax. Outraged, Angie Donahue publicly criticized the investigation of the police, and in response, Sheriff Cravens would restrict access to all of the found evidence, including the tapes and film. For the next year, Angie would attempt to sue the Burkittsville Sheriff's Department in order to release the evidence, however, these attempts were unsuccessful. Finally, over a year later in October of 1997, the tapes and film, along with the other pieces of evidence, would be returned to the families, and Angie Donahue would reach out to Haxon Films in order to attempt to piece together all of the recovered film in a cohesive order of events. Among the evidence that was given to the families after the case was deemed unsolved, were 12 16mm film reels and 10 high 8 camcorder tapes totaling over 20 hours of total film. It was later decided that along with piecing together the footage into chronological order, it would be beneficial to cut the film into both the documentary that Angie's daughter Heather would have wanted, as well as a film to spread awareness and potentially solve the mystery behind the disappearance of Heather, Joshua, and Michael. With Angie's approval, Haxen Films would recruit filmmakers Ed Sanchez and Dan Myrick to piece together the film into what would become known worldwide as the Blair Witch Project. As the release date for the film crept closer and interest in the Blair Witch grew, the film crew at Haxen Films would create multiple documentaries in order to help spread further awareness about the missing trio, as well as give more information behind the Blair Witch legend to the public, who now have been hearing about this mysterious film through word of mouth, TV, and of course, the internet. The first of these documentaries was Curse of the Blair Witch, which first aired on the Sci-Fi Channel on July 11th, 1999. 19 days before the Blair Witch Project's theatrical debut, and would later receive a home video release. This documentary features interviews with various individuals, such as Heather's mother Angie Donahue, Heather's film professor at Montgomery College Michael Decada, Joshua's girlfriend Lisa Toller, and multiple experts on folklore and history. While this documentary does discuss the disappearance of the trio, its primary focus is on The Legend of the Blair Witch, the history of Burkittsville, Maryland, the former town of Blair, and the terrifying events that would occur over the course of two centuries leading up to the events of the Blair Witch Project. The next documentary is Sticks and Stones, an exploration of the Blair Witch legend, which was released on home video via Blockbuster on October 26, 1999, shortly following the home video release of the Blair Witch Project on October 22, 1999. 
In its first half, this documentary tells an abridged account of the history of the Blair Witch in comparison to the previous documentary, and uses its second half to focus much more on the disappearance as well as the efforts to find the missing trio. It also features footage of the found tapes that weren't included in the final film, specifically a scene in which Michael reassures Heather that the predicament they're in is not her fault, and, after breaking down, reassure each other that they need to keep moving and try to find their way out. In September of 1999, a book entitled The Blair Witch Project, A Dossier, was published by Penguin Putnam. Written and compiled by Dave Stern, the book is a comprehensive collection of not only every last bit of information of the website, but the entirety of Buck Buchanan's investigative notes and transcripts, which were previously unavailable. While the book does spend a majority of its pages retelling things that were found on the website or within the documentaries, its last 56 pages or so give us a few new things. For example, it's here where we learn that Ron Cravens, the sheriff of Burkittsville and the one butting heads with Heather's mother, Angie Donahue, over his dismissive nature over the case and unwillingness to release the film footage found in 1995, knew that the house at the end of the film that Heather and Michael were in was indeed Rustin Parr's house. Sheriff Cravens stating that he simply didn't say anything as to not cause a stir in the small community where those who were alive during Rustin Parr's murders still live to this day. The thing to note here is that Rustin Parr's house was burned down in 1941, on the same day as his execution, this knowledge leading Ron Cravens to believe that the film had to be a hoax, and that the students must have built a replica of Rustin Parr's house, as nothing else about what he saw would make any sense. Next, we're introduced to Diane Alquist, a psychic who had previously worked with law enforcement in the past and was brought on board by Angie Donahue as an act of desperation to bring about any new information to the case. Angie would send Heather's journal to Diane, who would then make notes throughout the entirety of the journal, which is scanned page by page and included within this book. And here we learn another fact about Heather that wasn't previously known to the public. That being... Heather is interested in the occult, at the very least to a novice level, and has been, by Heather's own words, sending energy to Ellie Kedward, as well as feeling a kinship towards her. Throughout the journal, Heather mentions multiple times how badly she wishes to see Ellie Kedward, or wishes her to make her presence known to the group, with Diane noting how dangerous it is to attempt to invoke Ellie Kedward in such a manner. After receiving the journal and getting back in touch with Angie Donahue, Diane travels to Maryland to meet with Buck Buchanan, Angie, and two other investigators who had been assisting Buck throughout the investigation, Stephen Whatley and Carlos Sonnenberg. Buck, Diane, Stephen, and Carlos decide to take Diane's advice and attempt a spiritual ceremony so that Diane can potentially make contact with Heather, be it physically or spiritually. On April 30th, 1996, the four prepare, deep in the woods off of Black Rock Road, the same road that Heather, Michael, and Joshua departed from on that fateful day nearly two years before. Diane instructs the others of what to do in order to prepare the ritual so that all goes according to plan. As the four sit within the circle and the minutes slowly pass, Diane enters a trance-like state. After 30 minutes of nothing happening, the other three begin to hear strange sounds coming from within the woods, before Diane starts speaking in what the others can only describe as a language none of them can understand. As the others begin panicking, Diane then says that she's in the house, and that she's running through the house looking for Michael, as if witnessing the last moments of Heather Donahue as seen on the found footage. Still in her trance-like state, the others panicking, they decide to leave, not wanting to chance getting lost as the trio did. The Blair Witch Project, being the compiled footage assembled by Haxon Entertainment at the request of Angie Donahue, was released in theaters on July 30th, 1999. The film features Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard, and Michael Williams as they set out to create Heather's documentary and school project of the same name. The first 15 minutes of the film consist of the trio filming around Burkittsville, Maryland, and interviewing various people in regards to the Blair Witch, 
most of which recount stories they've heard of the legend or their own personal experiences. The next day, after resting up at a local motel, the three go off to the woods and interview some local fishermen who recount further stories of the Blair Witch legend. The group then goes to Coffin Rock to film another scene for the documentary before heading off into the woods. After a day of hiking, the three decide to camp for the night before continuing the next day, though upon waking, Josh claims to have heard cackling in the woods the night prior. Eager to find an old cemetery deep in the woods, Mike and Josh continue to follow Heather, though Mike grows increasingly frustrated and unsure if Heather truly knows where she's going, despite her constant reassurance. Upon stumbling across several stacks of rocks in the middle of the woods, the group decide to set up camp for another night. While trying to sleep, the group is awoken by what sounds like something moving around just outside their camp, all around them, though nothing is seen. The next day, the group continues moving, with Josh and especially Mike clearly getting more unsure and hostile towards Heather. She reassures them they're heading in the right direction, and agree to camp for another night, promising Josh and Mike that they'll be back to the car by the following day, Mike and Josh both commenting on how they need to be back home due to obligations. That night, noises once again surround the camp. The following day, the group finds piles of rocks outside their tent very similar to the ones they found earlier. As the three continue to try to find their way out of the woods, Heather realizes that the map is gone as the anger between the three continues to grow. They aimlessly continue to wander until it's revealed that Mike, out of frustration, discarded the map into the creek, causing Josh and Heather to berate him as the group becomes more and more unsure and scared. Realizing that they need to keep moving, the group carries on, and come across a clearing in the woods full of strange, stick-like figures hanging from trees as night slowly descends upon them yet again, the three of them terrified of spending yet another night, all of them feeling as if something out there is watching them. Just as the previous nights, the three are awoken by mysterious sounds outside, as what appear to be the sound of children laughing grow louder. The three suddenly flee from the safety of their tent as something outside violently starts shaking it, the sound of children continuing as they run aimlessly through the pitch black darkness. The trio stay together until morning, upon returning to their camp finding it completely ransacked. As their sanity continues to diminish, the group continues to fight amongst each other and lose hope of getting out of the forest, especially after coming across a point in the creek that they passed the previous day despite traveling in a single direction the entire time, as if they went in a complete circle. Night falls upon the group yet again, forcing them to make camp, only to awaken the next morning to Josh completely missing. Heather and Mike continue through the woods as well as searching for Josh, but night falls once again, and the two set up camp. That night, while trying to sleep, they hear Josh's agonizing screams coming from somewhere deep in the woods, but are unable to locate him. The next morning, upon waking up, Heather finds a bundle of sticks and cloth containing part of Josh's shirt, as well as teeth and part of a human tongue. Though terrified of what she found, Heather chooses to not tell Mike and the two continue wandering aimlessly. During their sixth night in the woods, Heather records herself apologizing to Mike and Josh's parents and loved ones, and how everything up until this point has been her fault. Shortly after, Heather and Mike hear Josh once again yelling from the darkness. This time, the two decide to go out and investigate, leading them to an abandoned house in the middle of the woods. Investigating inside and still hearing the voice of Josh calling out to them, they find the house covered with children's handprints and strange symbols covering the walls. Upon entering the basement, without Heather, Mike's camera falls to the ground. Heather shortly follows down into the basement and sees Mike standing in the corner before her camera falls to the ground as well, bringing the film to a close. Directors Eduardo Sanchez and Daniel Myrick met as students attending the University of Central Florida in the early 1990s. 
Sanchez and Myrick, along with Greg Hale, Robin Cowie, and Michael Manello, would create the production company Hackson Films in 1993. Named after the 1922 documentary horror film Haxan Witchcraft Through the Ages, directed by Benjamin Christensen. Sanchez and Myrick, with this documentary style horror film in mind, now needed to piece together a mythology of which they could weave into the narrative of what would become their film. Taking inspiration from similar documentary style horror films such as 1972's The Legend of Boggy Creek and 1980's Cannibal Holocaust, as well as real-life American history, such as the story of the Bell Witch and the Salem Witch Trials, the two created the legend of the Blair Witch and the entire mythology, as discussed previously. In June of 1996, Sanchez and Myrick would put an ad seeking actors in that month's publication of Backstage, a bi-monthly entertainment industry trade publication. This ad called for actors willing to work in extremely challenging roles under very difficult conditions for a film under the name The Black Hill Project. Over 2,000 people would respond to this ad and were selected based off how they replied to Daniel Myrick's audition icebreaker, You've served 9 years of a 25 year sentence, but you're up for parole. Why should we let you out? In which Heather Donahue replied, I don't think I should be. Upon casting Heather, Michael, and Joshua, the three were given a crash course on using the CP16 film camera, Hi8 camcorder, digital audio tape recorder, and GPS, among other tools in order to create the most authentic experience possible. While most traditional films have the director present with the actors as each scene is filmed, the Blair Witch Project needed to be handled differently. With the movie being about three students lost in the woods with no one else around, Sanchez and Myrick felt it was absolutely necessary that the three film everything in complete isolation. If this film is to be believed, having anyone else involved would make it look too clean. The film was about three people getting lost in the woods with nothing but two cameras, an audio recorder, and some camping equipment, so that's all it's gonna be. On October 23rd, 1997, over the course of eight days, the crew would shoot interviews around Burkittsville and Germantown, and in the woods of Seneca Creek State Park in the state of Maryland. Throughout the segments within Burkittsville and Germantown, the trio were tasked with wandering around the towns and interviewing people about the Blair Witch to recount their own tales or stories that they may have heard growing up. While the majority of these people were actually planted by the film crew without Heather, Joshua, or Michael's knowledge, one wasn't even meant to be interviewed and without any prior knowledge of the Blair Witch, went along with Heather's story and completely crafted, in my opinion, the most memorable scene of all the interviews. Reportedly, when the directors and other crew members found that this person had been interviewed, they painstakingly tracked her down as she hadn't signed a release form since she wasn't a planted actor, even going as far as to contact a local veterans group to try to find her, as her father was wearing a hat with the group's logo on it. Luckily, the woman was found and she was eventually identified as Susan Gooch, allowing the scene to stay in the film. After the interview segment of the film was done, it was finally time for what the crew signed up for. The trio were given a GPS unit along with their gear and told one thing. Follow the GPS coordinates through the woods and stay in character, and from there, everything else will play out. The directors, as well as other crew, would be in the woods as well, but would maintain a distance beyond what the trio could see. From day one, the group would only know to hike to a certain point that the GPS coordinates led them to and to set up camp upon arrival. Upon reaching each point, the crew would leave a milk carton of supplies for the trio, each of the three getting food and a note for each of them containing directions of what to act out next while also instructing them not to tell the other two of what directions are on their own papers. As the days went on, as does in the film, the trio slowly start to bicker amongst each other, which, while this was indeed instructed to them, oftentimes was completely natural as they had actually become lost multiple times throughout the course of filming and were starting to get really annoyed with each other. On top of this, each day the group would reach their GPS point, the food rations left for them would be less and less. As the days went on, and the nightly disturbances from deep within the woods would terrify the characters within the film, these disturbances were just as real for the trio as while they slept, 
The crew would play terrifying sounds over speakers from deep in the woods, throw rocks, hit branches together, and, as shown in the film, violently shake the tent as they flee in horror. Reportedly, during this scene, as they're running from the tent, one of the crew members was standing in the woods wearing all white with white pantyhose over his head. This was supposed to be filmed, but wasn't, and honestly, the movie is infinitely better because of it. Everything that happened, such as that moment, was a surprise to the actors. Joshua disappearing was a surprise, as Heather and Michael had no idea that he left or where he even went. Walking for eight hours for a whole day only to end up in the exact spot they had started was a surprise. Even coming across the house in the ending was a surprise. Upon completing the film, Heather, Joshua, and Michael were informed of a secret that the directors had been keeping from them. The Blair Witch never existed. She never existed in reality, or even as a local urban legend as the trio had previously thought. Up until the final moments of recording the film, they thought that, while the legend was indeed real, they were making a film about said legend, only to find out that it was entirely created by Sanchez and Myrick. While the crew of the movie did their best to hide the fact that the Blair Witch Project was a work of fiction and that Heather, Michael, and Joshua were not lost in the woods and missing since 1996, once the film was released, within days, the three were showing up on magazine covers and daytime talk shows. In the current year, it's hard to imagine a time when found footage horror movies weren't released every summer, or a new one didn't pop into your streaming queue as Halloween approached every year. Even when The Blair Witch Project came out, the found footage film concept wasn't necessarily new. The found footage movie everyone seems to always point out as predating The Blair Witch Project is Cannibal Holocaust, released in 1980. The thing about Cannibal Holocaust is that the found footage aspect exists within the universe itself. The film is about a group of young filmmakers who go missing in the Amazon while attempting to film a documentary. The Lost Crew's footage is recovered, and while a television corporation wishes to air the footage as sensationalist exploitation, an anthropologist professor attempts to dissuade the executives as they watch the found footage together, occasionally taking a break to discuss what they've seen. While a large portion of the film is meant to be the found footage, there are often angles and shots that technically wouldn't be possible if the footage was indeed shot as if the characters filming their documentary were truly in the environment and situation that's meant to be portrayed. Furthermore, there are plenty of shots of the anthropologist and television executives talking that are shot much more traditionally. Another film that predates The Blair Witch Project that many often claim to have started the found footage genre is 1998's The Last Broadcast. The Last Broadcast is a mockumentary horror film in which documentary filmmaker David Lee investigates a mysterious event in which the crew for a paranormal reality TV show are mysteriously murdered while conducting an investigation of the Jersey Devil in the Pine Barrens. Of the crew, only a single member survives and thus becomes the main suspect behind the deaths of his three crewmates. David Lee attempts to break down the events of that night and prove that the killer may have been something much more sinister. This film uses its found footage in a manner similar to Cannibal Holocaust, in which it's played back for not only us as viewers, but those being interviewed for the documentary segments, slowly piecing together who these people were their relationships, and any evidence to support or deny the allegations of the lone suspect. What makes The Blair Witch Project unique is that if you cut out the logos that play before any movie and show it simply as is, all you're getting is the footage that the crew shot. There are no remarks by documentarians, no text cards popping up between shots explaining anything, save for at the very beginning of the movie, what you get is simply the footage as it was found on the tape, and one movie that I was able to find that does this exact same thing was the 1989 film UFO Abduction. UFO Abduction, also commonly known as the McPherson Tape, is a found footage science fiction horror film that is as true to the term found footage as it gets, and from my research is the first of its kind, in the sense that what you're watching is a found tape with no narration or cuts to documentarians discussing the film. 
Much like The Blair Witch Project, UFO abduction opens with some text and the rest of the movie is simply what was filmed on that tape. The film features a family celebrating a birthday party when, throughout the evening, things start to go wrong and the family realizes that they're being terrorized by something otherworldly. The film was made on a budget of $6,500 and is incredibly impressive considering the limitations. The dialogue and banter is all so incredibly natural and really feels like something you'd hear on a real home movie from that era. Actually, it very much reminds me of the YouTube video 2.30am at 7-Eleven near Disney World 1987, at least in the way the characters talk to each other and joke around. I also feel it's worth mentioning that the McPherson tape got remade in 1998 as Alien Abduction, The Incident in Lake County, but in my opinion is much more obviously scripted with actors spacing out their lines between each other, which really takes away from the natural talking over each other style of the original. Not to mention, it includes documentary style cutaways where people discuss what's happening throughout the film. Real we can sit here all day and talk about other mockumentaries that existed before The Blair Witch Project came out, like The Legend of Boggy Creek, which both Myrick and Sanchez have gone on record saying was a direct influence for The Blair Witch Project, or any of the other handful of mockumentaries made prior to The Blair Witch Project. The incredible thing here is that while The Blair Witch Project may have had obscure influences leading up to its creation, the influence it would bring to filmmaking would be on a level few films have ever had on the motion picture industry. After the release of The Blair Witch Project, dozens of found footage films would be released of varying quality from mediocre to… what the hell even is this? Yes, there was a sequel to The Blair Witch Project, and no, we're not going to talk about it. It's bad. Sprinkled in this post-Blair Witch Project era are a couple occasional gems, but really, you know what this is leading to. This is Jason Blum. Jason Blum is the producer behind countless massive horror films. Basically, his whole deal is he'll produce your film for a micro-budget, and with any luck, make it into a massive success. And if it doesn't do well, the micro-budget was hardly a loss. For example, Oh, um, may maybe, maybe not that one. But when you're looking at numbers like this, you need to keep in mind that $1 million budgets are not a lot for a movie, and we're not even talking about in comparison to the budgets of mega franchise films like Disney puts out. I'm talking just in regards to horror films. Horror films are often known for not being massive box office hits. As a matter of fact, there are only two horror movies in the top 150 highest grossing films of all time, and those movies are The Sixth Sense at number 147, which had a budget of $40 million and made $672 million, and It 2017 at number 136 that also had a budget of $40 million and made $701 million. My point here being that if you're looking to make a horror film, studios know that they aren't a winning ticket for making hundreds of millions. But what Jason Blum proved was that you could take a smaller budget and still turn it into a home run. Or rather, Jason Blum didn't prove this. The Blair Witch Project did. And The Blair Witch Project proved this to Jason Blum. In an interview with Nightmare Magazine, Jason Blum recounted that in 1998, while working for Miramax, he had the opportunity to pick up The Blair Witch Project and passed on it, only for it to become one of the most groundbreaking and impactful horror films of all time. The Blair Witch Project was very much the one that got away for Jason Blum, as at the time, The Blair Witch Project was the most profitable film ever made earning $248 million off of its $60,000 budget. This would lead Jason Blum to continue searching and searching until finally, a little film came along in 2007 that would be directly influenced by The Blair Witch Project. Paranormal Activity was produced, directed, and written by Oren Pelly as his first film and would prove to be an absolute juggernaut in the history of horror cinema. At the time Jason Blum would pick up Paranormal Activity, the budget for the film was only $15,000. Blum knew that with a similar marketing push as The Blair Witch, with just a little bit more money added to the budget, 
this film could possibly be the same lightning in a bottle situation, and he was right. The final post-production budget for Paranormal Activity came out to around $215,000 which is fairly close to the Blair Witch Project's final post-production budget, which, while unknown, is reported to be between $200,000 and $750,000. There were a few found footage films in the years between the Blair Witch Project and Paranormal Activity, most notably Wreck and The Poughkeepsie Tapes, both from 2007. But it was after the release of Paranormal Activity when the true found footage boom took off. But really, the seed was already planted. It simply took technology reaching a point where mimicking the Blair Witch Project style became easy, when the world would finally hit a point where everyone would have a camera in their pocket, and anyone with an idea for a horror film can attempt to make their own movie, even within their own house. The Blair Witch Project was able to fool the world into thinking that what they were watching was real. Upon release of the film, as the cast and crew made appearances on daytime TV talk shows and the veil was lifted, Many felt cheated by the lie that this entire movie was built upon. For some, it even ruined the experience of wanting to see it, as now, what they had heard about for months as this disturbing film of three people lost and terrorized in the forest, was entirely fake. In a way, The Blair Witch Project was very much a proto-ARG, or alternate reality game. Not so much in the fact that there was much audience participation in solving clues or cryptic puzzles, but simply the fact that, through other media sources, you could delve into the mystery, be it the book, the website, or any of the documentaries that were created. The world of The Blair Witch Project is quite literally an alternate reality that had documentaries in-universe air on television stations in the real world. While there exists many differing opinions on what an ARG is, and how much actual involvement of the players there must be in order for the project to be classified as an ARG, the Blair Witch Project, without a doubt, launched the concept of creating such a world, at least in a mainstream sense. As mentioned previously, the found footage genre existed, at least in some way, before the Blair Witch Project. While I feel the McPherson tape, or UFO abduction, is for all intents and purposes the first true found footage film, the Blair Witch Project was made at a time that was perfect for capitalizing on selling such a concept. I remember going to see Paranormal Activity at an early midnight showing, and I don't recall ever hearing of the studio trying to pass off the film as being real footage of a haunting, the way the Blair Witch Project did. And that's what makes the Blair Witch Project such a unique and special film. So, what is this video even for? To be honest, I asked myself that a lot while making it. As I previously mentioned, what makes The Blair Witch Project so fascinating is simply the timing of which it was released. Just early enough that deep internet research couldn't spoil it, and just late enough that it could be marketed through the internet and allow people to fall into this narrative of three missing filmmakers. This window was truly small, maybe four years at best, between 1998 and 2002. Any earlier, and the internet wouldn't have been as widely accessible, and any later, it would most likely have been spoiled. That is what makes the movie so special. As we saw with the McPherson tape, someone had the idea to do a true found footage film in 1989, and if one person had the idea and actually went through with it, I think it's safe to say many others at least thought of the idea as well. Ultimately, the timing of The Blair Witch Project was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It caught the world at just a point where a massive transitional shift in technology was occurring, and absolutely delivered. Because, in the end, what makes The Blair Witch Project so memorable was how it fooled the world, rejuvenated the horror genre, and was truly a case of the right film at the right time. Thank you for joining me on this look back at The Blair Witch Project. I've always wanted to make an editorial style video such as this, discussing something I love very much. I most certainly do not expect this video to do as well as any others I've made, considering the subject matter, but it was a project I've had in my head for years, and I'm glad I was finally able to create it. 
I have other ideas for videos in this style that I'd love to make as well, so look forward to that in the future. For those of you who love the iceberg videos, another iceberg will be next, as I have one that's quite deep in the scripting phase. This video was actually originally going to come out in January, but I had the opportunity to go to Maryland and visit most of the locations where the Blair Witch Project was filmed, so it put off the release of this video by a couple months. Anyway, I'd like to thank you, personally, for watching this video. I hope you listen to it while cleaning, driving, working, gaming, or any other activity you may be doing. That was my entire reason for wanting to make my videos in the first place, just to give you something to listen to, though I have tried to make the video aspect of the videos a bit more watchable. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you have a swell day.